you know, the English language is used, uh, you know, you can take words and monopolise words of the English language, and that's just the way it is. And um, people think that Māori kupu are exactly the same, and they can just take them and use them as and when they please. And for Māori, that's not the same, no? And uh, Te Ture Mo Te Reo Māori, uh, our language is a taonga, um, and we need to look after it, and we need to respect it. So it's in a different category, yeah. and we need to respect that and, and learn what that means. And that doesn't mean you can just trademark any Māori word you feel like or use it in your brand name whenever you feel like it. Today's episode is with the only Māori patent attorney in Aotearoa. They say, quote, content is king, and there is a growing appetite for Indigenous stories. But who owns those stories? How do you identify cultural property, and how do you protect the intellectual property around them? This is the domain of our guest, Lanel Tuffrey Huria, Indigenous 100. E te hoa, Lanel Tuffrey Huria, te nākoe. Yeah, no, Welcome to Indigenous 100. Thank you for being a part of the program. Really appreciate you coming Thank along. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I remember I get a call from, I won't say his name, uh, but he works for E New Zealand. Starts with H, ends in E, and in the middle is N Nari. <laughs> <laughs> and he rings me up about an issue he's got, right? And at the time, E New Zealand was looking at the word kia ora. And I said, bro, you're talking to the wrong fella. All right, you need to talk to someone who's, who's onto it in the field, particularly around trademark and intellectual property. And he goes, well, well who is he? And I said, oh, have you talked to Lanel? Mm. He said, oh, no. Can you give me some details and stuff? Then I think he rings you. Mm. Not long after that, I noticed that they'd kind of uh, uh, distanced themselves from their previous mm. position. Mm. What did you say to Air New Zealand when they called you? Uh, well, first of all, I explained... Uh, the reason why them trying to trademark Kyoto was a concern for Māori, uh, primarily because it's, uh, you know, it's our primary greeting. Um, it's something that has a really special meaning to Māori, uh, and so for someone to try and monopolise that is inappropriate. Uh, and also the fact that uh, Air New Zealand, not being a true kaupapa Māori organisation, uh, they needed to you know, retract from that. And so as a consequence, um, I think they they also realised that they needed to do some internal rebuilding to, to change that picture of themselves. And I think that that's where they're moving to now. How, how, how difficult is it to try and influence, um, to try and engage, to try and give advice, to advocate? Mm. Because you, you don't just work with Māori, mm. right? So how is it for you, how difficult is it for you to advocate on behalf of Māori rights and interests from a kaupapa Māori basis mm. when you're dealing with big corporates like mm. in New Zealand? Mm. Yeah, it is really difficult. You have to have a willing partner on the other side. They have to be willing to come to the table. And uh, when they are willing to come to the table, it's, it's really great. It's really great to work with them. When they're not willing to come to the table, it's more difficult. Uh, and that's a real challenge in the, in the work that I'm doing at the moment. Um, more, more and more challenging. Um, but we're seeing change happen, which is great, and um, hoping to make more steps in that. So what process do you go through to get people to, A, get them, get them to the table? Um, and I know there might be some intellectual property for AJ Party yeah. that you might not want to talk yeah. about because you've got to give the secret juice to other companies, but, but how, do you, how do you create the space? What do you do to, to enable that to happen? Yeah, I mean, I guess there has to be an issue first, and yeah. that's usually the case when you come to a lawyer like me, yeah. um, and issues come up. So with E New Zealand, they had the, um, you know, the the bad publicity around the, their trademarking of Kyoto, so then they realised they had to do something. Um, and that's often the case, so there's already an issue has come up, and so then the, the organisation or person is forced to deal with it. Um, and so then finding the, navigating uh, a way for them to deal with it that's consistent with their values and, and themselves, um, but trying to convince them of a, perhaps a, a different way of doing that sometimes where it's more consistent with Māori values. Um, and like I said, often most people are usually willing because Māori values are not inconsistent with 
uh, Pākehā values in most cases. Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of showing them the way, I guess, is, is probably how I deal with it. How often are you dealing with companies, or dealing with people even, who, who are just looking for the tick box, who are just saying, I'm on the right track, right? And <laughs> give me the okay to do that. Yeah, all the time, all the time. Really? So, uh, you know, in our Trademarks Act, um, the law says if a trademark is offensive, then it will be refused. So many times we get asked, is this trademark offensive? And that's all they want to know. And it's like, but that's, we, I tr we try and feed them a lot more information around, you know, what is the meaning of the word? Is this actually appropriate for your business to be using yeah. uh, a Māori wukupu as um, your brand name? And suggest some other ways in which they might embrace that in a, a much more larger scale. It's fascinating. Uh, you know, I wonder if you look at things like, um, I mean, there are some current issues, yeah. right, around, um, I think it's huru huru and <laughs> restaurants yeah. using Māori. I mean, even even people using Māori names for products. Mm. I remember, what was it? Um, was it a tra not the Transformers, you know, those toys that were trying yeah. to use Māori names. Bionicles, and all yeah. Yeah, but that's right. Yeah. Were you involved in that? No, 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 no okay. I wasn't involved. It was, yeah. Oh, but I they, started they, around that time. They must be interesting for you to kind of observe and, and see what, what do you automatically think when you see something like that? Or even if someone comes to you and thinks that, what, what goes through your mind when that kind of thing, appro when someone approaches you with that and says, yeah, this is what I'm thinking, or this is an issue, and mm. what should I do? Um, I, I mean, I guess, I, I mean, it depends on the client a lot of the time. If it's a Māori organisation, an own Māori organisation, then it's, um, it's usually taken that they've, they've done their research, they understand yeah. what, what this word means and, and so therefore they've decided that this represents them in an appropriate way. Um, for non-Māori clients it's about actually, does this represent you? Is this actually a true representation of your organisation? If it's not, then you might need to think about changing your organisation, is what we would say. Um, and so uh, we would usually steer them towards getting a cultural advisor, like a building kaupapa within their business, rather than just adopting a Māori word. So how difficult then if a company approaches you that says we've engaged mm. a cultural advisor, mm -hmm. and, and it must be hard for you to separate, you know, I mean, you're, you're Taranaki Ngārua Hine, you know, you, 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 you've got your own whakapapa, <laughs> Taranaki Maunga on your side, and of course you're, 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 you're Tāne as well. How difficult is, is it for you to, to take one hat off, or not even remove the hat off, I mean, you still wear a kōrawai, of who you are, how difficult is it for you to be able to separate that out from from what uh, an organisation or a company might have that says I've already got I've already got some advice here mm. and they say we can do this. Mm. Is that difficult? Does uh, it come up? That does has come up um, a lot of times, and sometimes I'll say, well, who was the cultural advisor, and we, you know, what what's their background to try and get a better understanding. Because uh, a lot of times people get cultural advisors in and they just advise them, well, I think, incorrectly because, you know, they tell them to use, the people have been told to use words like tika as trademarks. Um, and, you know, th that to me is just not an appropriate word to be a brand for anybody in, in most respects. But, um, you know, like, it's actually, I, I start to question whether they're actually getting good cultural advice. And so, therefore, there's a real need for us to have a cultural advice, some you know, advisor that becomes the sort of um, manda you know, mandated with responsibility for dealing with these things. And, you know, and that's what's being proposed in the Y two six two as a commission that can be established to look after, um, you know, that or take that role as a, a guide for people when they they need some cultural advice in this space. Hypothetically, though, someone comes along and says, "Well, take a." It's not quote unquote offensive. Mm. Are they able to use that word, that name? Well, well, and yes, they can use it. They might not. They probably won't be able to trademark it because it it has uh, certain connotations and it might be considered offensive, especially for particular goods and um, you know for cigarettes or alcohol or something like that. Um, but the other issue with Tika is I think if we've seen this great groundswelling of negative publicity that's. You know, every time somebody uses a Māori word and if it's not considered appropriate, there's quite a, a lot of negative publicity come out. We've seen those examples recently, which you, sh which you just mentioned. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, um, that's the risk that you take. If you use a Māori word, I, I think you do so at your own peril sometimes because you may be called out on whether it's appropriate for you to do so and you need to decide whether it is. Well, why do people not get it? 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know why people don't get it because it just, yeah, I think it, oh, I, well, actually uh, my theory, my opinion is, you know, the English language is used, uh, you know, you can take words and monopolise words of the English language and that's just the way it is. And um, people think that Māori kupu are exactly the same and they can just take them and use them as and when they please. And for Māori, that's not the same, no? And uh, Te Ture Mo Te Reo Māori, uh, our language is a taonga, um, and we need to look after it, and we need to respect it. So it's in a different category, yeah. and we need to respect that and, and learn what that means. And that doesn't mean you can just trademark any Māori word you feel like, or use it in your business, or use it, you know, use it to, uh, as your brand name whenever you feel like. It's, it's a completely different type in a different context that we live in. And I know it'll be different between clients or between people that contact you, but how long sometimes does it take to have that kind of fulsome conversation around, well, actually, this is, this is the problem we've yeah. got here yeah. and you, there needs to be some understanding and no, you haven't got a consultant or you might have, but how long does it take, does it take for you to have that fulsome conversation with people to yeah. be able to, until they at least kind of get it enough to second guess their kind of original approach? Yeah, I think... Um it, it doesn't take that long to have that conversation, but you know sometimes I do wonder if people truly understand what we're advising them, um, and that's you know we just have to give the advice, and then whether it gets accepted or not, that's a, a different story. But uh, you know a lot of the times people have decided not to adopt Māori marks because of the advice that we've given, which is, in my view, a win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The advice that you've given. Yeah. Could, could, how many other? Don't feel weird about this, but how many other Māori intellectual property experts like you are there out there? I'm, well, I'm not sure there's any in that work in an in intellectual property law firm. Yeah. Um, in fact, yeah, I don't. There's none. Um, so I'm trying to build up my team with a young Māori wahine lawyer working for me. So, um, you know, hopefully, there's lots of passionate Māori lawyers out there that want to get into intellectual property. But it's so hard. It's such a small industry. Why is it so hard? Um, G given the amount of cases that we've got, yeah. you know, we've cited some already. Why, therefore, is it so hard for people to get into? Is it just really technical? It's really technical. The industry is really technical. Um, to get into an intellectual property firm, um, yeah, it's, it's a very technical area of the law. Generally, you need a science or a uh, engineering degree to to get in um, mm. and do that kind of work. Um, trademarks is a little bit different, you know, primarily a law degree, um, but it's just because of the nature of that work. Um, there's there's no other Maori doing patent attorney law or drafting patents or anything like that. It's because it's just you you need that that technical expertise plus the legal expertise. Can you give me an example without talking about a specific case? I know that's really difficult, and sorry sorry to heap that upon you, but is there an example that you can give which kind of explains or, or in, in implies the kind of real technical aspects of it, which is why it's so hard to get into? Yeah. So when you, uh, when you file, or when you create a new product, there's lots of aspects of intellectual property potentially in that product. Yeah. So. Um, you may create a new chair, for example. It may have some new technical, uh, some new um, uh, fancy mechanism within it that you could possibly patent. Um, and so you need to understand how that technology works and to be able to describe that in what we would call a patent. Um, and so that technical expertise is, is you know, quite specialised. Uh, so you need to be able to describe that and then write that in a legal document we call the specification. Um, and so that's the that's a pretty good example of, of some of the um, the expertise that's needed. Other areas are like um, like chemicals, like new compounds. Um, so you need to have a, a chemical or biology degree, or um, and then a lot of the new inventions are in things like nanotechnology, which again another real specialised area of science. Um, and then there's of course there's computer software and you know all the technical aspects of that. So you need so you need to for a, uh, our firm, for example, we have experts in, you know, nanotechnology, biotech, um, engineering software, so that we can cover all of those sort of areas. But um, it's very specialised and very, yeah, very quite unique, quite different to uh, an ordinary law firm. Wow. And and 
in your firm, in AJ Park, are you, so anything that has anything remotely mildly in it comes your way? Usually, usually. So, Not so always, so, but so, usually. So how do, you, how do you deal with it is, say for example, yeah. nanotechnology, because there's a bit of that going on in Māori mm. at the moment, right? How might you approach, approach, I suspect you don't have a nanotechnology degree or whatever no. it might be, but, but how do you approach that? Yeah. So I guess um, nanotechnology in, in a Māori sense, yeah, that's, I mean, I guess that's, that would come back to some of the issues dealt with in Y262 and the sort of the, um, you know, the, the, the chemical compositions of those particular, um, of our native flora and fauna, for example. Um, and so I would probably refer to that as my first guide in terms of what advice I would give in that space. Um, if it was truly an invention and we were working with the kaitiaki or the, you know, who were considered the kaitiaki of that particular resource, um, then that would be, you know, that would be amazing. I don't think we haven't yet. If I um, just throwing that out there, I would love to, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it would be really fascinating to sort of work in that space with a Māori, uh, you know, organisation that was working in nanotechnology. It'd be awesome. How, how do you determine who or what the kaitiaki is? Well, again, I'd, I'd probably be seeking advice around that. I would, uh, if it was um, in Māori organisation, I would expect them to know. Yeah. And, and, and they usually, when you work with Māori, they know that, that, that they understand the kaupapa, so yeah. they understand the issues. And they will have already gotten the necessary consents or approvals or uh, whatever they need to to ensure that, that they can move forward with this kaupapa. So is there any one particular example <laughs> or any, any one pattern in particular that you can recall where you just thought, wow, this is, um, this is unbelievable, I can't believe I'm, I'm working here. Yeah. I can't believe I'm working on this. I, I can't off the top of my head, but um, there are some pretty, pretty cool things being made, uh, you know, that come up in patents all the time. Um, you know, there's, uh, what can I think of? Um, Oh, ugh, there's just too many to think of actually, well, but 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 and it's hard because I, I have to think. Can I talk about that? Yeah. One or, <laughs> I, uh, know putting, I know yeah, I'm putting. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. It, sometimes because sometimes because because they don't get published for eighteen months. You can't talk about the ones that are very recent or the ones that are still in progress. So um, yeah, I couldn't really. But there's lots of fascinating, you know, uh, machines that um, uh, open muscles in a particular way to ensure that they come out the freshest. You know those sorts of initiatives and and you know new new m new machines working with seafood are, are quite common in New Zealand. So that's that's really unique. Um, new ways of uh, new grasses and new seeds that kind of you know create new uh, you know grasses that that grow with less water and that sort of thing. It's quite fascinating. Wow. Mm. How how did you get into this? Into intellectual property. <laughs> I know there's a story about how you got into law, but so, so maybe let's start there. What, what, why, why did you choose? Why get into law? How did you get into that? So I actually got into law because I was working at AJ Park. It's right. kind of um, so I got into story. a little bit backwards. Yeah. So I um, I went to university, uh, had my career path all planned out. Accountant. That's what I was going to be. Um, Kind of, and then I, I got sidetracked a little bit with, um, I, I really enjoyed maths and stats and so I ended up doing a BA in, in stats and operations research as well as my commerce degree and decided I was going to be an actuary. Um, which is a, which is a, for the uninitiated like myself. Uh, so an actuary um, assigns value to risk. Oh yeah. yeah, so they can work out what your insurance policy, what you should pay for your insurance yeah. policy. Um, so I was really good with numbers. Uh, at the time, my father was a patent attorney at AJ Park, and he I had worked there as sort of uh, doing all the odd jobs in the office. And I'd worked my way up to quite a junior, senior assistant, uh, like an EA, um, doing quite senior work and uh, for that level. Um, and the managing partner at the time, when I finished my degree, said, oh, uh, what are you going to do now? And I said, oh, I just missed out on a job. I didn't really know what I was going to do and I thought I'll just carry on working there until another job come up and I could get it. And he said to me, well, why don't you do a law degree and why don't you just work here and be a trainee patent attorney? And I said, oh, 
like I didn't have any other options. So I thought, yeah, okay. Um, and then I started my law degree and loved it. I uh, started my paid and attorney exams, really enjoyed it. Um, and then, you know, sort of the, uh, started to work with Māori, like we started to get more Māori clients coming in the door. Uh, Y262 was happening in the background, which I was sort of watching from afar. Um, it all sort of come together uh, until, you know, my aunties rang me up and said, Linnell, we've got an issue with poor air, we need you to come give us a hand. And it sort of like was full circle for me to come back and, you know, do work with them and sort of solidified why I was doing, well, I was in the right place and doing what I was doing. So, so much to unpack there. So, so <laughs> let's let, let start at the end with, with poor air. What, what was the issue with poor air? Uh, so, um, it's still on ongoing. Uh, they... The club has trademarked Poye to protect it, to stop others from using it inappropriately. Um, and others felt that they shouldn't have. And so we're still working on how that might work out in the long run. Um, you know, these things take time and, uh, you know, they, when was that phone call? It was probably 10 years ago. So we're still working that out. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, you know, I remember watching my aunties, going to holidays with my aunties and watching videos, kapahaka videos with them day after day after day. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of, it's just kind of meant I was, it sort of proved to me I'd ended up in the right spot. Yeah. Uh, and all these sort of little other journeys I went on led me to where I was. Wow. And by the aunties, are you talking about Nanny, Bub and Bib? Yes. yes. Are they your aunties? Yes, yes. How are you related to Nanny, Bub and Bib? Uh, so they're my great aunties. So wow. yes, yeah, so I should really call them Nanny, Bub and Nanny, Bub. But yeah, yeah, they're my great aunties. Hard case. I, I, I performed with them, oh, 1993, 94. Ah. Um, and of course, um, Nanny, Bub married a prime, right? Yep. The prime is a prime yep. up north. And so Terry's a mate of mine, yeah, yeah. a tutiri, yeah, yeah. funky or melmac. <laughs> um, shouldn't have said that, actually. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, uh, oh, wow, I didn't realise you were related. Name, I'm gonna ask <laughs> yeah, Mellies, Mellies, call them Mellies. Everyone calls them Mellies in Auckland. Um, oh, so, so, okay, so, so we, we've talked a little bit about Puyo. I didn't realise that were your father. So you, you're, you're party are hard. Mm, mm, wow. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, so you're related to Matua TR. There you go. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, and then so back a bit before before Paul Year, you talked about um, that AJ Park had encouraged you. Did, by the way, were they were they supporting you to go do your law degree as, at Victoria University? Yep. Yep. So they uh, uh, supported as uh, as part of the package, the employment package. Yeah, supported me to attend. So I worked full time, studied part time at. Um, at Victoria, um, yeah, it was, it was. It's not easy. Work. Yeah. Like working full time and studying part time, particularly law. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was hard. I, I think back now, I not. Sh sometimes I wonder how I sort of managed to fit it all in. But yeah, I guess you just do what you have to do sometimes. So, so how did you manage? Um, I guess I just crammed a lot. <laughs> crammed a lot and. Um, that sage yeah. educational advice. Oh, yeah. That's, sage. yeah, I did cram a lot. But I I think I, I mean, I, I was always fixated on getting to the end. And I think that was always kind of the driver. Where, yeah. do, where do you think that comes from? What, why? Why yeah. is that the case? I think it was my upbringing, if I'd be like my, I think my parents were always um, quite diligent in terms of ensuring we had a good education. My, my mum you know, she taught all of us to read and write sort of before we started school. So we were kind of always ahead of the game wow. when we, you know, when we went to went to primary school. Um, it was just something that was always ingrained in us. And and my father was always sort of pushing us to, to do better. You know, we'd come home with a, you know, a really good score in a, in a maths exam. And all he'd focus on was, why'd you get those two wrong? You know, those <laughs> ones are the easy ones. You know, just sort of always pushing you to always be better and always be focused on on a goal, or achieving something in the end. So yeah. Your dad's the one from Taranaki. Uh, my dad, no, my mum, my mum. Oh, my, but my dad's from Taranaki too. He grew up in um, in Bell Block, and oh, yeah. uh, oh, Plymouth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. What? And you said your dad was at AJ Park as a mm. patent attorney. Yes. Attorney. How did that? How did they, oh, so he, um, it's actually, his story is quite interesting because he uh, he was a scientist at uh, Ashley Wallpapers in, Pori, in the Porirua yeah, factory, which yeah. is where he met my mum. Yeah. Um, and he got 
uh, laid off. They closed down their laboratory and uh, I'm not sure how old he would have been. He would have been in his 40s, I, I, reckon, I, I think. So he, was, he had to um, change career. Um, and my uncle was a patent attorney at, at another firm. And your dad's brother. my dad's brother was a patent. And he happened to mention it to um, the managing partner at AJ Park and sort of said, oh, my brother's lost a job, he's a scientist. Um, you know, have you got a patent? a job for him in your science team or your chem bio team and, and they did at the time and so he had to retrain as a patent attorney sort of later in life. So he didn't, you know, it wasn't a career that he aspired to be but ended up in by chance but he always said he loved that job, he really enjoyed the job that he did at AJ Park and when he was there. What does he make of you being a Oh, I, he, I mean, my dad passed away uh, eight years ago now, or nine years ago, sorry. Yeah. And, uh, the, you know, when he retired, uh, he, he made a speech which, uh, you know, and he spoke about, uh, about how proud he was of me, which was really nice, which, you know, at the time, I had a lot of tears streaming down my face. Probably the first time he ever said he was proud of me. <laughs> wow, mm. wow. And so, because you started at AJ Park, you were 16 or something, yeah, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah, so that was where I started when I was when I started at university, and so that. So hang on, hang on, wait, wait. You started at university at sixteen. Yeah, so yeah, so that's normal age, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> it's seventeen or older. <laughs> so I um, I um, I went to oh no, sorry, uh, maybe I did start at seventeen. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> but I um. But I, I did work there while I was at school too. Yeah, okay. So I worked okay. there when I was at school, sort of in the school holidays. And then when I started university, I, yeah, I sort of was a more semi permanent role. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, I can't remember. Maybe I've got my ages. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm not so good at math. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't, no, 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 no. If you, I mean, I didn't even understand the second thing you were doing with math, to be honest with you. So. And because I know you talk about the fact that your your parents encourage you, you you know, reading and writing before you went to school. But why why maths? What was the what? Why was it so easy for you? I, yeah, I'm not sure why it was so easy. Um, I just loved numbers. I think I, I just love numbers. Still do. Yeah, still do. I still do. I still, you know, I count the randomest things when I'm you know out Life. walking around. I don't know how many how many stairs I'm walking up, you know, or you know, as I'm walking, I'll just randomly start counting. I don't know if that's because as kids we were that was drummed into us again. I think you know, sort of counting things are, are that were around us all the time. Um, but yeah, I just had a, a real affinity with numbers, and I must admit, in the fifth form, I had you know, my, he was one of my he was the most hardest teacher, but he was my f most favourite teacher you know, throughout my whole te uh, school co school career, if you can call it that. Mr Aldred, he was our fifth form, um, or fifth form, year 13, oh year 11, right? Yeah. Teacher, um, and he was, yeah, he was just, he was just, he was bad. He was really, you know, like he'd come in and do these amazing um, long division off the top of his head, and I was just like fascinated. I was just like, oh my gosh, he's just, uh, He's just the, you know, just the, just the bomb sort of thing. Um, I didn't let anyone else know that. that I thought that, but, but I did at the time. I was just like, man, I just want to be like that. So yeah. So how hard was the transition going from what you love doing, which is maths, into going and studying law at the same? I know you had a job at the same time, but how hard was it transitioning across? Because I've met a lot of lawyers. Mm. Some, some of them are okay at numbers. Yeah. A whole bunch of them aren't. Yeah, yeah that's true. I mean, I think. Um, I think maths is, because maths is, like there is a logic to it, like there's a... Logical and for, formulaic. And formulaic and, and areas of law is a bit like that as well, and especially, especially at university I think it is quite formulaic because they want you to write in a particular style and if you can meet that criteria then you'll tick a lot of the boxes and, and that alone will, will help you okay. um, throughout, your, throughout your studies. Um, but I think... You know, there's always, um, I guess it's, the other thing with maths is it's about solving problems. And that's what law is, it's about solving problems, it's about solving legal issues. Um, so that's the other thing that I think it sort of aligns to it. And 
I really loved the law when I started my law degree. Um, jump, so it wasn't it wasn't a hard transition. It was actually quite easy because yeah. I did enjoy it. It showed uh, to me why things are the way they are in the world that we live. You know why we have parliament, why we have why we have the police. You know the origins of the police and why the Queen is our head of state and those sorts of things. And I just found that all really quite interesting because I didn't do any history studies. You know. At, 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 um, at college or at university and so all of that was really quite fascinating because right. I hadn't studied that before and I wish I had but um, you know sort of I'd just gone down this other path. So because the, the other thing I guess about the law is everything is open to interpretation T to a certain degree right there's yeah. a judgment made and all that kind of stuff but you can kind of still question and debate I mean you yeah. know yeah, there's way of appeal courts yeah. and you have the Supreme Court and all, and, and all that kind of stuff. Was the idea that potentially there, there weren't many others in this field, Māori particularly, mm. in this field, was that a part of the thinking as well, or just not really? That wasn't even a part of the rationale about pursuing a career in patent law? I don't, uh, yeah, to be honest, I don't think that was part of my rationale, um, getting into intellectual property. I think it, beca it, it certainly is now, um, and probably, you know, sort of, 10, 15 years ago, it definitely was as well. Um, you know, I kind of become the go-to for Māori issues in the firm. Sort of started to realise that we needed to look at these problems from a different perspective and actually not stick to how the law is. It actually needs to evolve and shape it in a different way. So kind of, I see that role as really important and part of the reason why I've stayed in the industry so long because I know that this needs to happen to ensure that, you know, our cultural heritage is, is looked after. And if, if I, if I'm not in that industry, sort of uh, m making these noises, then it may fall on deaf ears. Or the other thing is, is that there's a, there's a heavy amount of responsibility that comes with that, knowing you're one of the only ones in the field. In fact, if you are the only one, well, that's even more sensitive. Yeah. Does how does that play in your thinking? The oh. fact that there aren't others, that this is a crucial role, mm -hmm. that there is a need for good advice, good perspective, uh, the responsibility to act on behalf of Māori. I mean, do you see it that way? Yeah, I do. I, I do. I do feel, um, I do feel that burden quite a lot. Really? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I know that others have been fighting this fight and we think about the Y262 claim in particular. You know, others have been telling these, you know, uh, telling these story, our story for a long time in this space. But, you know, I think about the IP industry that I've worked in, like, it was just a, no one really cared. You know, no one was paying attention to that issue, in my view. Um, and nobody, nobody was doing anything about it. They weren't preparing for it. They weren't educating themselves about it. Um, you know, they kind of had their heads in the, in the sand a little bit and I apologise to my colleagues in the IP profession, but some still do. And it's actually, you know, it's a time for that to ha that change to happen. And I think change is, people are starting to see that there is a need to change and we do need to change, but it's about, okay, it's good to, to see that there's need for change, but it's actually making that step, it's gonna be quite difficult. How do we do that step? How do you do that? Step? How do we do that step? So I mean, it, it, it's going to be it's it's a bit a lot of work, and it's going to need a real rethink of our IP laws that we have in New Zealand, and some work's been done on it, but it's still really just tinkering at the edges, and we actually just need a whole a whole new framework. And that the commission that was proposed in the Y two six two report is definitely the place to start. Now I think once we get that sort of commission set up, then that will be the fora for developing our laws because I think it just needs a whole lot of thinking, a whole lot of, and it's, we're not gonna get it right the first time, it's gonna be need to be a bit flexible and you know, eventually we'll get there, but it, it will take, take time. Well, I remember I, I interviewed Del, uh, fine, Del a, a number of times when I was at Māori mm. TV. Mm. Um, very passionate, very committed, and of course she, she didn't get to see the, the final result of all that mm. work, not, not on her own, you know, I think, I think of Sana Murray and others, you know, who were involved for a long, long time. There's so many of them. Um, and, and again, didn't get to see, have, we still haven't seen the fruition yeah. of their work, particularly yeah. in the recommendations yeah. of, of Y262. 
the, the recommendations of your, your view of Y262, what, what else? So yes, there was a commission proposed and others, and I remember I was at a meeting um, related to Māori media and there was a, <coughs> a Māori intellectual property expert in that meeting who said, you know, the one thing that we can do is reaffirm the recommendations in Y262. Yeah. That's right, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> it was you that said that, I thought it was very sound advice. Yeah. What are the recommendations of Y262? And in your view, will they help us deal with issues like leather shops calling using Māori mm. names, mm. restaurants potentially using Māori names mm. and things of that nature? But what are, just if you can go through again and recollect, what are the recommendations of Y262? So the re the, I mean, the re there's loads of recommendations in, in the report that are specific around uh, flora and fauna, but in relation to intellectual property, it, it does talk about setting up a, a commission that would have a number of roles. One, it would be like an adjudicator, so like a court. It would make decisions about uh, who, uh, who has misused or misappropriated a particular piece of cultural heritage. Um, they would also ident help identify who's the kaitiaki of that cultural heritage and so who should be the person you should go to yeah. consult. Uh, but they'd also be, um, and this I think would be their key role, is develop those guidelines and um, best practices that would help guide you know, our society in terms of how we use our culture and heritage, how we use our flora and fauna. You know, that is going to be the biggest role that that commission plays. Um, and that's, you know, how we contract around, you know, how we contract around the use of our flora and fauna. How do we contract around, you know, um, uh, developing a movie or a, a Māori media story around, you know, that's a, a Māori story. Who owns the IP in that story? What's the correct process for ensuring that Māori, you know, are recognised as a kaitiaki but are still enabling that story to be told? Like all those things still need to be worked through and developed. How will, will it? I know we're talking very hypothetically here because the, the government has yet to. Uh, you, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, of course. Officially respond mm -hmm. in action to the recommendations out of Y two six two Wild Dead or Tene. So, so will the will the authority in, or the commission, in your view, be able to deal with some of the international issues that we've? seen accrue with the misuse, well it's actually it's bastardisation in my view, yeah. of Māori intellectual property. Yeah, no unfortunately, the, and that's a, another big issue is no, it won't, it's only going to deal with New Zealand issues. And because of the sovereign authority of that nation to be able to use yeah. aligned with its commercial yeah, intellectual right. property rights and rules and all that. Kind that's of right, yeah, so it's only limited to New Zealand we still have to work out how we're going to deal with the international frameworks. We have the, um, you know, the United Nations Declaration That's on right. the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which, which set, spells out a framework for us to work under. Um, I, I truly believe if New Zealand sets the scene in this space and sets up, you know, what is the baseline, then other countries will follow. You know, other Indigenous peoples will seek the same recognition in their countries, and so therefore there will be this groundswell from below, you know, requiring that these these minimum standards are met. You oh, and you maximum standards too. Yeah, maximum You are part of the, uh, um, um, make sure I get this right, the International Trademarks Association Subcommittee, Indigenous People Subcommittee. Yeah. That's how much of an issue is this, how, how big of an issue is this for Indigenous peoples across the world? Are, are they dealing with this, and the, uh, uh, are they having to grapple and deal with the same issues absolutely. that we're dealing with in Aotearoa? Yeah, More? Yeah, Less? Absolutely. I, I feel like, uh, I'm not sure if it's more, I guess um, we're lucky, well, if lucky is the right word, um, you know, Māori seem to, uh, are calling out these issues uh, when we see them anywhere we see, anywhere we see misuse or misappropriation around the world. Um, and a lot of indigenous peoples don't have the same uh, coverage or the same or the ability in some countries. You know, they don't have the voice. Um, so in that respect, we are able to highlight the issue. Um, and in other countries, they are starting to highlight the issue as well. I haven't seen as many uh, misuse or misappropriation uh, as as we have seen of Maori culture. But I'm sure that 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 it is happening. We're just not aware of it. 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I have a look in America. Um, we started to see some change, and this is potentially because of the ge geopolitical issues and particularly the president of the country at the time, but we started to see a change in, we'll have a look at the Washington NFL team. Yes, yes. yes. The change in the name of the Redskins and, and, and others. Is the time right now, do you think? I mean, I guess, and this becomes a responsibility for you as mm. well, unfortunately. <laughs> Because, because of, of where Māori's sit, and as I say, you occupy that space at the moment, is the time right now, sh should we be working, being, be, should we be a lot more staunch, where's Māori be a lot more staunch with our government mm. in trying to implement that change now, given how I think the world is ready and waiting for yeah. this? Yeah, I, for sure. I think we should be, I think it should be the, the next big thing for Māori that happens because, and, you're, and, and for, not only for that reason um, that you say, but, but yeah, it, it, it Māori are seen as the guiding light for Indigenous peoples around the world. Mm. And so if they see that we can achieve this, then they'll be able to achieve, hopefully achieve it as well. Yeah. Um, and that's, I mean, uh, you know, around the world, especially post-COVID, you know, every country is looking at Indigenous people to lead the way for for uh, solutions, yeah. and you know, and this is just another area where they're going to start looking for at our, at our culture um, to try and uh, find those solutions. And so we need to make sure that our culture is protected before they before they take it. How well known is Y two six two, and potentially the recommendations out of Y two six two? How well known is that, and recognises that by other Indigenous peoples? Particularly given your experience as a part of the subcommittee. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it. I think it's well. I, I understand it's well known around the world. I mean, I I know when it was first filed, it got a lot of profile in the in, in the IP industry as because it was you know sort of one of the sort of uh, revolutionary claims around the world. Um, it was highly highlighting the issues with the intellectual property system that were just starting to um, you know grow in other fora. Uh, so it was it was truly revolutionary. So it is known, um, but I guess because we have this ability to raise claims, whereas they most Indigenous people don't, yeah. um, they haven't been able to advance their their position further as far as we have been able to. Now I know your clients aren't just Maori organisations. You have also have, and COVID may have changed, changed this, I'm not sure, you also have international clients, don't you? Mm -hmm. West Coast America, I think it is? Yes, yes. How do you deal with that? Um, it's interesting. Um, it's, it's a completely different type of client. Uh, I mean, in terms of service, it's still the same. Same service, excuse me. But um, but um, it's it's fun. It's actually fun working, you know, working with international clients. And, and that was my, when I first got into intellectual property, I worked purely with international clients. Really? Um, and because it's quite a good way to train, uh, because there's a lot of cases, uh, and you know, it's great seeing uh, a, pro a, a trademark that you work on, you know, you fight for it to get it through, and then you, then you see it on the shelves in the supermarkets. Like, it's actually quite rewarding to see that, what? you know, that business process actually come through, you know, f come through to fr fruition in some way. Um, so it's fun. It's it's interesting. They you know they and they also have really challenging cases, different c challenging cases for different reasons. Um, like and, oh well, you know when you file a trademark, you have to meet the criteria yeah. of the act, and um, you know we might have a particular issue in a different area of the act, which uh, we have to try and um, advocate for them on, on their behalf. So really interesting. Um, so yeah. so hang on, they they're, they're having to apply under our act yes. to go to market in New Zealand? Yes, well. oh, okay. yeah, to use their, well, to register their brand in New, in New Zealand. They can use their brand in New Zealand um, without registering it, um, but, you know, it is risky doing that, especially if you haven't checked that somebody else has got the mark already, uh, so you might infringe somebody else's mark. So international corporations tend to be a little bit more um, risk-averse in that respect. Uh, certainly because they want to avoid any um, bad publicity mm. um, and they're quite, uh, you know, they do, they, they are quite, um, what's the word, vigilant about that because, you know, they have a, a, a bigger international reputation to, to, to look after. And are, there, are these big name companies that yeah. you... Yeah, yeah, big companies. Any, any we know? Um, 
that you were allowed yeah, to? Yeah, um, I guess well, we work with, you know, um, search engine companies and <laughs> social media companies. Oh, ah, right. Yes. So um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I understand. Um, what, what, what do you tell your kids you do? Yeah, that's really hard. Um, to be honest, I've, they've never asked me. Really? Um, yeah. Um, they haven't asked me. And If they did, what would you say? I mean, would you just say lawyer? Because if you said lawyer, they'd go, ah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they do. They do. I, I, mem I remember our younger son, he said to me, I never want to do what you do, Mum. You work too hard. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if they asked me, uh, I would say... I don't know what I would say. I try and figure out a way to say it to them in a way that they would understand. Um, so, I mean, I help people um, protect their in or intellectual property, their brands primarily. Um, it, it's part, of, it's helping people build businesses, I guess. Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. You know, you could mention a, a social media company or a, <laughs> <laughs> or a global could, search yes, engine yeah, and say, I help them get their yeah, stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although given some of the coverage, maybe not. Um, but but the reason why I asked it is because because you've got how many kids? Do you have? three boys? Three boys. Three boys. And your your youngest is ten. Twenty. Oh, sorry. Yeah, twenty three. And your eldest is twenty eight. Wow. How are you able to sorry. do all that and train? I'm just trying to do the maths in my head. But how, how are you able to do all that and train with? Yeah, them. so, um, well, I mean, we, our whānau is a blended whānau, um, so my, our two oldest are my, my husband's sons, uh, but I did have uh, our younger son while I was studying for my law degree, um, so it was halfway through my law degree, halfway through my patent attorney exams, so it was pretty hard, I was really lucky. And full time? And full time. Work. And you were hapu? And I was hapu, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty... Pretty, pretty full on. Um, how, how did you get through that? I, I mean, I think I, I mean, I was so privileged to have my parents. You know, I was able to move back home, able to, you know, sort of um, retreat, I guess, in some respects, into that safe cocoon, and you know, just, um, just, you know, enable me to focus on what was important. You know, my mum was sort of kicking me out the door, get back to work, get back to your studies. You know, I'll look after. Your son, you know, she was pretty much, that's what she was telling me to, you know, she couldn't wait for me to get back to work. Um, you know, uh, I was so privileged to have that, you know, family support. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, did, did it ever, did you ever think this is too much? You know, um, that this is... Um, I mean, you know, just on the work and the and the and the educational front is heaps, mm. but at the same time, being hapu and having a child is mm. massive. You know, I mean, did, was there ever a time where you thought, man, what, uh, you know? I don't know if I ever thought I wanted to chuck it in. I think I, um, I definitely felt like, you know, I was it was hard. It was hard. Definitely. Anyone who's done second year law knows that that's the hardest year. Like it's just so so hard. Talk me through that because people say this yeah. all the time, and I tend to tune out because um, my very good <laughs> friends are lawyers. But um, you know, uh, as a, as <coughs> someone with a bachelor of arts, we tend not to be. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, wh why was the second year so tough? Oh, it's just uh, it's um, there's a lot of a uh, lot of reading, a lot of reading, a lot of um, uh, you have tutorials which you have to prepare for. So on top of your three lectures a week, you have a tutorial. Um, so you're just constantly under pressure to keep up with all the reading. Um, and then you have like assignments in between. And in second year, I remember the second year because I was studying, I was working full time, and this was before I had uh, my son. I took on, I thought I could do two full year papers that year as well as work. And then they chucked in this extra paper, which was um, legal research and writing on top of. So the first half of the year, three papers, and I was just like, that was when, I, this was before my son, but that was really, really hard, really hard. Um, but I think, you know, after my son came along, when I talked about, 
you know, retreating. I was kind of able to focus and I was just so determined to get it done. I was just like, I had to, I had a child to provide for. I had to make sure I got, you know, this, these qualifications so that I could provide for him and provide a future for him and ensure that, you know, sure that he had a future. Um, and provide the same sort of environment that he, that my parents provided for me as well. One day. Wow. Mm. Wow. I, um, I, I, I find that absolutely mind-blowing, if I'm honest with you. I, I don't know how you did it. Mm. I don't know how you do it. Um, so, you know, the responsibility you now have to represent Māori rights and interests and intellectual property, pretty easy, actually. <laughs> Add on, you know, yeah. other indigenous populations yeah. around the world. Ah, easy. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty easy. Um, okay, so so say we get this, Y262, we get this commission done. And, and I, th I, I get the sense from you that that's really important for you mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's really important in the work that you're currently doing, mm -hmm. particularly around protection for Māori rights and interests. What then? What What's the other big thing that you're worried what's the other big thing you're wor not worried about what's the other big thing you think of a lot that needs help what, particularly for Māori rights and interests related to the work that you do what, what, what other things not keep you up at night but have you concerned yeah I think um, I, I do think and we've talked about this in groups that I've been in that you know if we even if we get the commission that's probably still not going to be enough we're still going to need that constitutional change um, to, you know, recognise and give a full effect to Te Tiriti o Waitangi um, for the Commission to actually have the ability to do what it needs to do. Yeah. Um, so that is, those two things need to happen to ensure that our cultural heritage is looked after, our, our cultural heritage is hugely important to our, our children, our mukupuna, um, for them to have a sense of, of place, for them to have a sense of themselves. Um, we, you know, they need to have that in the future because this world is just going to get more crazier. So, sorry, you're talking about a legal constitution that sits with the Commission, not a new constitution for Aotearoa New Zealand? Oh, no, a, a new, you know, a constitution that sits above, you know, a new constitution for New Zealand. Wow. What do you say to people who are concerned that in doing so you actually end up usurping the Te Tiriti o Waitaki? Given the constitutional framework, relationship that we have with yeah. the Crown? I, I mean, I think it has to align with Te Tiriti o Waitangi. I, I don't... Um, I, I think that's critical. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely critical. Because that has to align and so therefore the Commission can do what it needs to do to give effect to Māori rights and interests. Uh, otherwise, is your concern that the Commission potentially will be similar or akin to the An tribunal? Advisory? yeah. Like the tribunal, yeah. which, which, which is very important, right? Yeah. And um, I, he I hear the phrase a lot about Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm -hmm. um, which, which, don't get me wrong, is really important, but its ability to be able to influence the Crown, I mean, people use the phrase, it doesn't have teeth. It, it does, yeah, yeah. but the Crown can choose to basically ignore what yeah, that's right. in the Tribunal. Yeah. And, and, and for all intents and purposes, from many people's perspective, is doing it now yeah. with, the with relationship to Y262 recommendations. Yeah, that's right. so, so without that constitutional frame, without that new constitution, you think that the Commission will simply end up like... A tribunal, potentially. I think there's a real big potential it will. Yeah, we need that. We need to have, we need to have, a, you know, that, that true recognition of the treaty at that constitution level because then we can implement what's required to give proper recognition to Māori interests and Māori rights um, and kaitiaki interests and kaitiaki rights, which is what they talk about in the, in the Y262 report. But... You know, we can't have that if we don't have, you know, the constitution at, at the top level. Your, your uh, colleagues at AJ Park must be, I don't know what the word is, but they, they must be kind of, um, oh, they must be amazing people because they've, to, to have someone of your now experience and expertise working with them, I mean, it, it must be awesome for them to have that, but also... I assume that you've also told them, well, this is the lay of the land and this is what we need to be doing, and they've probably bought into it, have they? I mean, how does that, how does that 
dynamic work with your associates in AJ Park? Because yeah. you're a partner in AJ Park. Yeah, a, a principal. Principal, sorry, principal, yeah. Um, but it's, it's interesting because we're still navigating that, I think, because I think there's still, uh, you know, there's our intellectual property laws um, are derived from an, our international relationships with other countries. And pretty much the, our laws have been imposed on us to, um, to ensure that those trade relations flourish. Um, so that's why we have these laws that have no basis in te ao Māori, no basis in te kanga, no basis in kaua, um, you know, and, and no basis in any Māori values, yeah. although there's been some tweaking. Um, and so it's just a, it's quite a, um, you know, they're, they're at two ends of the spectrum. And so we do still have some traditionalists in our industry. And I, you know, I have full respect for my colleagues because that's what that framework is designed to do. You know, that's what it, it is designed to do that. And so therefore, you know, that's what they live and breathe. And I'm just coming at it from a different perspective because this is what Māori live and breathe and we need to recognise our Māori, you know, origins and our Māori customary law because that's what's, what's true to us. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's interesting because people are coming around, uh, you know, after Māori Language Week last, week last year, we had a few people go out and get some te reo lessons and, you know, I felt, oh man, that's a win, <laughs> you know, like so, and people... You know, we're starting more people saying kia ora around the office and things like that, yeah. and um, it's it's really awesome to see. Like, given where when I started, that would just never have happened. <laughs> um, so the the organisation has moved along. Um, I think there's there's a lot more we can do in, in that space, but you know, these things take time, and and um, you know, I do take my hat off to to my colleagues because they are embracing this and it's been really wonderful and it's enabled me to grow too. How important is that, our ability to have them a part of the journey at the same time as we're trying to progress mm. because there'll be a school of thought, and we've talked to a couple of people, um, who would describe themselves as activists mm. and Māori activists who say, oh, pay a Yeah. You know, we don't need them on the journey with us. Mm. That's a, that's a kāwanatanga mm. side. Mm. We need our. We we need to be doing it ourselves. We need to be working with ourselves. We need to be engaging with ourselves. In your view, how important is it to have not just your associates, uh, but the intellectual property community, for want of a better way of putting it, uh, supporting, endorsing. Uh, you know, not endorsing, supporting, assisting, mm. a part of the progress that we need to make. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's critical because they are those technical experts that we need, um, and Māori need technical experts. Um, you know, we're having lots of, I'm having lots of conversations in, in some time, and with you as well, around, you know, Māori need to be owning these the, this IP, we need to be creating and owning IP um, so that we can lift our economy to that next, our Māori economy to that next level. Uh, so we need those technical experts, and we need them to understand what our, where we are coming from. Um, so. I think it is important to bring them along the journey. Yeah. Um, I think we have to engage with this profession to, you know, to shore up our Māori economy, especially, you know, in the in the years that lay ahead. Um, yeah, so I think it's really important. Yeah. I, I think it's really important. Okay, you you know the other thing I think is um, if we don't move fast enough or move quick enough, or or, or or you know we just start getting really frustrated at the lack of progress, yeah. particularly from from government, mm. central government, mm. in upholding, enshrining the recommendations mm. of Y262. Potentially the only other way to do it is to have the real Māori expert in this field actually a part of central government. <laughs> have you thought about that? Have, have you I been asked about, about that? I have been asked to stand for um, before. Ooh. I have been. From? Um, oh, I can't say. Oh, I come on. Say. Come on, um, Linnell. I'll tell you if you tell me. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I can't. No. But I, um, I guess the thing and the reason I, I haven't is because I'm still the only person, Māori IP lawyer, you know, that's, that's, that's saying this to my colleagues. Um, and I, like I said, I'm trying to build up that within our firm. Um, I know there's... Lots of Māori, like I said, Māori lawyers that are keen and interested in, 
and Māori intellectual, intellectual property as a career. Um, until we get that sort of that, those numbers up, then I might think about it at that point. But um, but you're it for now. But yeah, until that I can pass that baton on, then I guess I, I kind of see it's really important for me to stay to keep that connection with the the IP profession and sort of so I can keep that conversation going in that space. Well, I, you know, I, th I think it's a fascinating field of work of endeavour that you're involved in. Um, for obvious reasons, I think it's fascinating. I mean, it's, 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 it's of massive interest to Tao Māori. And um, I can only commend you for the work that you've done so far and wish you the best of luck for the work you've got ahead of you. Um, and you look, unfortunately, unfortunately, as a result of this conversation, uh, you'll probably get lots of people asking you for free advice. In fact, I know in preparation for this just about an hour and a half ago, people were wanting to have a free consultation with you. Um, and oh, I apologise for that. That's <laughs> okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm all up for the free consultation. No, come, you can't say that. You're not yeah. allowed to do oh. that. <laughs> we do do... Oh, no, I shouldn't say. No, 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 just forget we said that. Um, but, but thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. being a part of Indigenous 100. Yeah. Thank you for, well, you know, hey, it's not for me to say, mm. but thank you for the work that you've done. I've, I've appreciated just the conversations that you and I have had, and I'm sure that anyone else who wants to engage with you will have exactly the same experience. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.